My name is Ashley Nance. I'm the one who's been emailing you and who have con who has contacted you. I am the professional development manager for the Block Career Center. And honestly, my biggest job is to help students get jobs and to help them explore different career areas and explore different industries that are out there. And so today's panel is one of four panels actually, and this is the last panel of the day to explore different careers and explore different areas that are out there. And obviously we're talking about small businesses and entrepreneurship and what it's like to really explore that space. So I have a series of questions for all of you. Um, I'm hoping you're excited and ready to talk about uh, what your experiences have been and what your journey has been. Um, this is being recorded and we plan to post this to our YouTube channel. So even though we have a small audience right now of about 11 students, um, we do have a pretty good reach through our YouTube channel. So your guidance will be seen by others if you're open to it. Um, and then uh, one last housekeeping thing. So Alec Rogers with Betty Ray's was supposed to be on the call today. Unfortunately, he had a freezer emergency, which you can imagine is a pretty big deal with ice cream. So he is not going to be on the call today, but uh, he said he was more than willing to connect with anyone through LinkedIn. So I just want to make sure that that's an option for all of you as well. All right. So any questions before we dive into this? Really, I am so excited to have all of you here to talk about your journeys. I think honestly, just small businesses are fascinating. I myself am one to really buy and promote local and uh, do that sort of work. Uh, when it comes to my own personal dollars. So I'm just excited to just learn more about your own experiences. So why don't we start? I'll start with uh, really just, I know David, I'm the one who, uh, who reached out to you first. We'll start with you. Why don't you just start with telling us a little bit about you and your company and where you're, you're, what you're kind of doing right now. We'll, we'll go into more depth about what your actual job is <laughs> uh, in a little bit, but we'll start with a brief intro. Yeah, absolutely. You can hear me, yeah? Very good. Yeah. My name is David Klasser. Nice to meet you all of you. Uh, I own Klasser Brands, which is uh, multiple different small businesses in the marketing space. So we help businesses rid themselves of bad marketing and execute a marketing plan that actually works. So I live and breathe marketing every day. I love it. Uh, sometimes dream about it, which my wife thinks is kind of creepy, but uh, that's, that's my world. I, I live and breathe it. Awesome. Matt, you want to go next? Yeah, my name is Matt Basinger. I am the CEO of SwellSpark. You probably know us better as either Breakout KC or Blade and Timber. Um, so we have been uh, rolling for six years now. Started this company as a bootstrapped company um, and have since grown to 10 locations ranging from Honolulu on the West Coast all the way to Nashville on the East Coast and are still actively growing. Uh, our headquarters are, are right in Kansas City, Kansas, just right in the West Bottoms area. So thank you all so much for having me on today. All right, go for it, Austin. Yes, uh, hey everyone. Um, so Austin Sonker, I'm with Tohi. Um, we're a CPG health and wellness uh, platform. Uh, we feature a unique core ingredient called aronia berries, which are very nutritious for you. We have a line of ready to drink beverages out in market right now with four flavors. And then we have other products in the development pipeline right now as we speak. Awesome. So let's go forward with talking about your actual day-to-day -day jobs. So most of the students that are on this call today, they range from undergraduate students to graduate students. Uh, their career ideas might be interested in entrepreneurship. They might be interested in startups. They might be interested in just hearing what it's like to own your own business. And so tell us about your job. What is it like to work in in just a small business space? What's it like to be in entrepreneurship? Tell us about what you do and feel free to jump in. I'll jump in because I'm unmuted. Um, you know, we started our business really as a side job and, and most of my, just to all monologue here for about two minutes, if that's okay. Um, so I was a high school guidance counselor. I actually used to work for the NCAA. I worked for the University of Kansas in athletics for a while. Um, but when I moved into sec secondary ed as a guidance counselor, I had summers off and I realized very quickly that I'm not very good with downtime. Um, and so my wife, like, she really wanted to lay by the pool, you know, and I did that for like 45 minutes and I was like, what do we do with the rest of summer, you know? Um, so I started my first company uh, that I've since sold back in 2011. 
uh, started another one in 2014 that I sold in 16. Um, but, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur is oftentimes one of the best things. Like I got to ride my bike all morning um, and you don't get to do that sometimes. But then when there's things like COVID, uh, it is the worst thing because you realize very quickly um, that there's a lot of people relying on you and, and especially when you let them down. So we've had ups and downs. You know, our company was up to 250 people pre-pandemic. We had to lay off all 250 folks, um, which was a total gut check. Um, but it, we've been very fortunate to be able to rebuild from that. But um, I think there's a mindset to entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit, I suppose, which is this idea of, hey, there's probably another way of doing this. Um, and just looking at how, how you can take the experience that you've received, either the education that you've received, and, and find a way to do the things that you love um, in a capacity that allows you to also do it in the way that you want to do it. And so there's highs and lows. Um, but now that I've been kind of in this world for eight years, nine years, I don't think uh, I could ever go back to, to another version of this. So kind of a vague answer, but it's the best you're getting for right now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of jump in with my take on it. You know, for me, um, you know, what it's like to work in a, in a small business. So, um, you know, here, here at Tohi, it's about, you know, sort of the, the, the challenge that, that entrepreneurial mindset, Matt said, but, you know, your, your willingness to run to challenges, think creatively outside the box. Um, you know, it's definitely, you know, I always sort of joke with people, you know, talk about what I do is, you know, my title is director of finance and operations, but I mean, it's really just dependent on what's going on that day. You know, one day is production plan, the next day is marketing, it just kind of ebbs and flows. So you have to have that, that mindset of being able to jump into any areas um, and, and really help out. But yeah, I think overall, it's sort of having that mindset, that, that, that creative, that, that take on a challenge mindset. You know, I always joke, you know, that we're you know, we're boxing above our weight class here, you know, especially in the beverage industry. You know, I'm going to retailers fighting against large brands like Palm Wonderful and Naked Juice and these other beverage brands to try and get just a little bit of shelf space and how can I compete with them without the resources that they have. So um, it's definitely a lot, there's a lot of fun days, but there's also a lot of days that, you know, just really push you, but that's where you discover how you can take yourself to the next level is my viewpoint. So a little quick little backstory. Um, I've since college, I've kind of done the freelancing route. And so for anyone watching, if they're curious what entrepreneurship is like, I would for sure say one, go the freelancer route if you can, or find someone in your space that does what you want to do and really, truly interview them and take time to understand what they do. Uh, I started in the freelancer space in the marketing side as a college student, and then I actually went out to have a full-time job as a marketing manager at a company here in Kansas City, and then I took the leap from that side. So entrepreneurship every day, uh, like Austin said, has its highs, but then oftentimes it's putting out fires. I always questioned whether or not, you know, like a sports team has a coach, right? Or a business has a CEO. For whatever reason, I always question, like, what do they actually do? Like, what is it that their day-to-day -day activities look like? And as I stepped into that space myself, running multiple brands, marketing companies, um, it's come apparent to me that a lot of times they put out fires, they wear multiple hats, I think, as Matt said, uh, and, uh, um, they really lead the company in the vision. And that's quite harder um, to do than one would expect. So for those looking to start the entrepreneurial lifestyle, it's not all really glamorous. Yes, as Austin said, I'm sorry, as Matt said, you know, you can ride your bike in the morning. But that time is often filled with putting out fires, um, depending on how you build the business. And I'm sure COVID uh, for many people has just been a big downer. Um, for me, not so much but I've had clients who have really taken a shot at it. So the entrepreneurship lifestyle and what I do every day is a lot of putting out fires, a lot of leading the vision of the team, a lot of selling um, and just anything under the sun, honestly. So, but it's fun, it's rewarding, but also very challenging. 
Well, I think that's a good segue, I guess, into our, our next question. I think all three of you kind of mentioned how you maybe got into this venture or how you really started about owning your own business. But is there anything about this industry or anything that you want to add about why you stay and what you really enjoy about it? Um, obviously, riding bikes in the morning and have time for that is, is a really great perk, per too. And so are there other things that you want to add to that? So I'll, I'll start. The biggest thing, the reason why I started my own business is because at the end of my life, uh, I, I always think about the end of my life and try to picture what I regret not doing, right? Um, and I think the biggest thing I would regret not doing is building something of my own. Um, from an early age, I knew I wanted to go into marketing. And uh, I, not only that is other people told me that I, they think I could do this, right? So it's, it's one thing I have a passion, another thing to actually be able to execute on it. Uh, but the reason I stay in entrepreneurship is to build something of my own. Um, working for another company is fantastic and that path for other people is needed and everybody can't be an entrepreneur. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's very glamorous, it seems like being on entrepreneurship. Um, but the main idea for me is to build my own business, build something. It's like building a building, you know, putting bricks on top of bricks. Maybe the bricks aren't the right form the first, right? And the foundational is a little wobbly, but you end up smoothing out those bricks and building something truly that you're proud of. So that's why I continue to stay in it because I want to build something. Uh, my time is invested in something that I can see grow uh, over years versus um, helping someone else grow their own business, which again is not a bad thing. There's a lot to be learned in that space, uh, but it takes a specific soul uh, person to to have that mindset and to stay in it. Uh, I've passed the three-year mark now, and uh, I think some of my other friends have stopped after the one-year, two-year mark because it's just it's just quite hard. But that's why I do it is to is to build my own uh, foundation for my future. Yeah, I think I would echo what David said. I mean, I think there's there's a lot to seeing something from nothing come to life and then see that how you can grow that and you know that's that's truly why I, why I stay is it's you know the job's not finished you know we're still building we're still got goals we're still every day striving to get better so you know and, and to Matt's point he mentioned earlier about you know you got a lot of people writing on things and that's one thing that you know you're you know in a small business um, especially early on you know you're making a lot of key decisions that really matter and there's a lot of people that write on those decisions and it's there's a lot of, you know, responsibility with that. But I think, you know, for me, that's something I, I love to do. You know, I came from, you know, I spent before this, I was in banking um, and doing financial services. And to me, I just felt like one cog in a big machine and that I wasn't necessarily being able to directly impact the direction of the organization. So, you know, coming on board um, and in this atmosphere has been, you know, truly a blessing for me. Um, there's lots of times when you're, if you're, if you go this route that you're going to have chances to exit or you're going to think about it, you know, cause it's, you know, you have a bad day, a bad week, you know, COVID hits and you're like, how am I going to make it through this? Um, you know, but it's, it's that determination that, you know, you're still building, you're still, you're still getting better. That keeps you coming back every morning, it keeps me excited to come into work. I took a risk assessment a while back. Um, and it was pretty funny just because it had a, a handful of different styles of risk. You know, there was like physical risk. So do you like, I don't know, going on a jet ski or a motorcycle or something like that. And there's like financial risk and all these other things. And, and I scored, I think it was like an eight or a nine out of 10 on every risk factor except for bodily risk. Like I don't like to put my, my body in harm's way. Um, but I think, I and mean, we've all kind of talked like there's this, I think lingering feeling within me, David mentioned this too, of like, man, what, what do we get to accomplish in this life? Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, it's like, I want to try to give as much as I possibly can. Um, and so I think I, I have a higher risk tolerance than many. Um, I'm probably willing to break more rules than some uh, is, or like what are perceived rules, I suppose. Um, but my, my mom uh, ran her own business growing up as well. And she always told me I was entrepreneurial. But I didn't know what that, that meant. I hated business classes in undergrad. I actually ended up getting a sociology undergrad and an education master's degree. 
Um, so I didn't know what it meant to be an entrepreneur because I didn't know, like I had no business idea in mind. Um, but I think, again, going back to what I said earlier, it's, it's kind of this way of thinking of just like, hey, there's, there's the way things have always been done. And then there's the way that they could be done. There's taking this thing and if just, just twisting it just a little bit and saying, we're going to put my own special flavor on this thing. Again, I, I think what all of us are doing, like marketing is not a unique thing, right? There are thousands, millions of people marketing, making really high quality, um, you know, tasty, delicious stuff that's good for you is not a unique thing, but it's how we do it, not just from what we produce, it's how we do it as well as the company and the culture that we get to spend, you know, eight hours a day being a part of and cultivate and hopefully make it a place that people enjoy showing up and, and to be proud of. And so that's the piece that, again, like, I, you know, I didn't really know, like the financial piece, it's not my bag. I hired somebody to do that. Um, I get to focus on vision. I get to focus on, for us, doing really cool stuff. Like literally we wake up, we're like, okay, our goal is to make it easy for people to have fun. How do we do that? Um, and however we can accomplish that, that's our, our, our single mark that's like, this is what we're going to do every single day. Um, so great question, actually. Awesome. So then let's kind of segue into your job so far. And has there been a really valuable experience that you've had that maybe taught you a lot about what you're, what you're doing currently? You know, COVID, I think everyone who I've ever met in business has talked about the learning experience that has come from that. I think there's a lot of businesses that are operating a lot smaller, a lot leaner, a lot smarter. Um, in having to kind of go through the fire and, um, and figure that out. And so uh, we were pretty fat before that. We had, our headquarters was almost double. It was, it was double the size of what it is now. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing because we've been a growing company, but I think we were really able to get a grasp on the business side of doing business, not just the growth side. And so, um, you know, when I, when I have the opportunity to speak, I get to share all sorts of cool stories and we got to host President Obama in Hawaii and we've got to have a bunch of country music stars in Nashville and all this cool stuff, right? But like, there's all sorts of really, really awful days and nights as well. And those are the things that you learn from. Like if you don't learn from those mistakes that you've made, then, then they actually are mistakes. But if you do in fact take a lesson from them, it's oftentimes hard to even get mad that it happened. Like at this point, obviously COVID from a business standpoint sucks, but like, our business is better because of it. We are a stronger, more succinct, but we have clearer vision. Um, so it, as cheesy as it is, like every failure under the right frame of view can and should be a learning experience. And we've had lots of them. <laughs> learning yeah. experience. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, yes, Totally agree with Matt. What he said, COVID has made businesses much leaner and, you know, these fat companies that think they can have so many things going on at once. And, um, they, they got lean really quick. Um, whether that be the space they lease or, you know, people working from home and the processes and the systems they use. Uh, but for me, what I've seen within my industry, my clients, and then just my businesses myself is a personalized touch. Now, that's really important. I think in any company that you think of creating or a business that you work for right now, personalized touch, meaning how do you make sure your customers are not just a number, but they're actual human beings. I think that's always been the struggle, of course, no matter what industry you're in. But uh, that's the biggest learning experience that I've had. Um, it's easy to get customers, whether you're B2C or B2B. B2C uh, might be harder. B2C, B2B is a little bit easier to make a personalized touch, but um, anything you can do to make sure that they know uh, you care for them in a, in a different way than just being a number on, in your CRM or for your sales. I think that's been a big learning experience. Had some trial and errors, right? It's just so easy to do, but it's harder to actually execute. So that's been a big learning experience for the last two years for me. Yeah, something that's been very valuable for me um, is, you know, sort of the mindset of, you know, don't get too far out in front of your skis. You know, I think, you know, some things, some opportunities will come your way, especially with the new product. You might get some new, you know, accounts. Um, 
and it's very easy to say yes. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. It's a sale, you know, to expand, to grow, but you know, sometimes the right thing to do is to say no, you know, to make sure that you can actually support it, that you can grow with it, that you're not getting yourself too stretched. You know, I think maybe early on we did that a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's, it's always humbling when that happens, but you know, it's, it's a good problem to have, uh, you know, you just need to get refocused, always, always stay focused on what it is you're trying to do and make sure that you can support it and that you are set up for success. So you don't, you know, put yourself in a tight situation down the road. So Matt and David, you both alluded to how COVID maybe has shifted. Obviously, Matt, your business is dramatically um, and, humbled. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And David, you mentioned that you've had some learning experiences as well. Is there anything that you wanted to add about, or any all three of you wanted to add about how COVID has maybe impacted your particular business and what that looks like maybe going forward? Yeah, we're still. Um, you know, ho hopefully those of you who are watching, you've been to either Blade and Timber or Breakout KC, but we're still not allowed to be at full capacity at, at almost any of our stores. I think we have one store where we are still, you know, at full capacity. Um, we've nearly fully recovered from the customer facing side. So like our weekends, our date nights, things like that have come back. Um, our corporate audience, which is you know, 30% of our total sales are still, like Kansas City, downtown Kansas City is still desolate. Um, there's a lot of businesses that I don't think will be returning to the office until, you know, September-ish, August-ish at the earliest. And so there's still a huge chunk of our, of our company that we're missing. Um, so, but golly, I mean, the, the biggest thing, I guess the most no noteworthy thing that we did in the midst of COVID is we partnered with the Jay Rieger Distillery we helped distribute over 12,000, you know, distribute hand sanitizer to over 12,000 people in Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and Hawaii. Um, and I think, again, like the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, being small, being nimble, being able to maneuver quickly, that was something that we turned on quite literally overnight when, you know, having conversations with the Rieger family, we realized there was a need for a distribution channel. Um, so... I think it reminded us that while we were starting to get big-ish in the grand scheme of things, that we still had the ability to change really quickly, um, which is what allows small business in some ways to be successful as they can adopt, adapt um, and adopt new principles and new kind of business practices very fast because there's not a lot of red tape. Like I am the red tape of my company. Um, and so that was, I think, a great reminder of who we are and what we're capable of. Matt, uh, I've been to Blade and Timber and Breakout Kansas City multiple times, so you've done a great job there. Uh, I think uh, during the um, here in Kansas City, the fall festival, I think last year, I think you guys were there. I can't remember. I the, the we have some mobile axe throwing later. There we yeah. go. So I've done that. So we we really enjoy that. So I hope you guys are up to full capacity at some time soon. Um, I mentioned uh, allowing brands to have a more personalized experience with their customers and more an online experience. Like really honestly, what you do, no matter if you have a physical retail store or you're online and you, you, you sell a product or you sell services, um, there's a level of customer experience that every company now has really truly begin to prioritize. Like how do your, how does your audience interact with your website? How do they read blogs? Um, is there a free tool that you can give away that somehow associates with what you do in a solving many problems within your audience's, um, you know, desires or, or problems, right? Uh, that's affected my industry quite a bit. And so, whereas we would focus more on in-person events, obviously we have to focus on online events, webinars, free tools to give away, PDFs, lead generators, like all these things are becoming astronomically more important than they were before, which I would, of course, argue that it should have been a priority before. But uh, something like COVID just scales it up a notch and makes people a little frightened, uh, which from my perspective is a good and bad thing. I think COVID was obviously terrible in many different facets, but also very uh, uh, beneficial to some of these companies uh, to become more lean, uh, like we've talked about. 
Yeah, I, I would say from, you know, like an operational side of things on what COVID's really sort of shown me or highlighted <clears throat> on that side is the, the extreme importance and value of having strong vendor relationships with your suppliers. Um, it's, it's these times when you really sort of need to lean on those relationships um, and be and be transparent with them. Um, I mean, because this COVID had a ripple effect through everything. So, you know, don't don't take them for granted when everything's great. You know, do everything you can to, um, you know, to be on their good side, to build strong relationships, um, you know, really make it a priority to, you know, pay them on time and the good things and all that stuff. So if you, if this, you know, if a, uh, an event like this comes out nowhere again, you can, you know, they're more willing to work with you if they know that you're a good partner um, and they can trust you. And everyone wants to see you succeed. So, I mean, I think just build those relationships while you can um, and it'll pay dividends for you when you need it most. I'll add this real quick too, of course, obviously financial, um, it smacked people in the face, but having a good reserve of cash and doing your finance as well. Uh, I know a lot of businesses and friends who just operate almost like in their personal life, paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that can get you by for a little bit, but the, the more structurally sound you have your finances, um, those are the ones who kind of succeeded in COVID uh, or at least excelled more than maybe some of my other friends who were operating day to day. The same personalized, you know, your budget, you need one for your business. And so you need different accounts set up and a cash flow to make sure that any emergency, like an emergency fund, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. Um, it's, 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 very important. And you don't think about it. You're like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll you know, create this product or do this service and it costs $5,000. You're like, sweet. Okay. Then I'll use this to do this. And uh, having a, a decent sized cash reserve of three to six months, extremely important. Great, great, great points. So Austin, I, I even um, thought back to your points about relationship building. Um, our two previous panels, we had a supply chain panel this morning and a real estate panel um, at 11, and they all mentioned the same thing, that um, these areas, it's so much about being able to work with your suppliers and work with um, clients and being able to have really good relationship building ability skills and be able to communicate well with those, those folks, no matter what space you're in. So that, that was a great point. Thank you. All right, so what is a common misconception that people might have about owning your own business or what this looks like? You get to wake up in your jammies and do nothing for most of the day and then answer a few emails <laughs> and then take, you know, get off at two o'clock and watch some Netflix and chill out with whoever you want to chill out with. Typically, you just work <laughs> way too late, uh, which can be way unhealthy. Uh, with workaholics like I assume Austin and Matt are and all these other panels are. So big, big misconception. We had a, a pretty funny situation recently. Um, we, we do our annual reviews every April and we had some, some of our direct staff members, uh, so our customer facing staff members at our stores. At one of our stores, they said, you know, the only thing that we think this company could do better is they should do profit sharing with, with the employees, um, which, you know, there's a lot of conversation about right, that, and it sounds really good. What they don't know is that still coming out of COVID, we're losing about $8,000 a month at that location. <laughs> and so we're like, so do we, do we send them a bill for, <laughs> like, like how, how does this work? Um, but it is, I think, We've had some um, we've had some success as a company. We've had you know some really good years leading up to COVID was a really good season. I think now coming out, it's a really good season. Um, and I, th I think there's this idea though that every business owner is just filthy rich, you know, um, that every dollar goes straight to them. And, and the idea of margins and understanding of like no, like every time, you know, a customer comes comes in and gives us thirty dollars like my bottom line is I probably get just making up a number like 28 cents from that customer you know and it's like some it's like where does the money go but you, you get in um, you know I, what I found is I'm really good at making money again I had to hire some folks to help me kind of keep it and make sure it goes to the right places um, but even in my head I, I didn't come 
in the traditional sense where I had this really great formalized business plan with every penny accounted for. I was just like, oh, this kind of works, you know, like this pricing structure feels pretty good. And, um, but then the more you get into it, the more you realize like, oh my gosh, I thought we were going to make $3 on that thing. We made 27 cents. Like, where does this go? Um, and, and so this is where I'm like, man, I probably should have paid more attention to like business 101 and business 102. They should have done that like afterwards. So those should, should be like the 200 and 300 level courses, like start with the vision and then get into the nitty gritty stuff. Um, but I think that that's been certainly a, a misconception or a misperception of business owners is that like, it's just all good and it's all fun. And um, I, I think all of us are kind of weird in that like I, my fun is an accomplishment. Um, it's not in just like, you know, I don't go throw axes every day. I don't go do escape rooms every day. My, my, the fun that I have is in building these processes. Um, and so uh, I don't blame people for it, you know, and I, and I play into it and have fun with it, of course. But um, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it that I didn't know up front. And had I known up front, I probably wouldn't have gone into it. So I'm also really glad I didn't know all this crap beforehand. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would uh, sort of kind of tell these guys. I mean, like David said, it's you know, I guess it's David's misconception. It's not. It's not all glamorous. You know, I think I think for all three of us, from Matt and David, you know, you know, um, you know we really probably love the the strategy, the vision, the the direction of the company. We love doing that stuff. But you know, you, you're working nonstop to make that happen, and that means that like you have to do like. The, the, the gritty work to get there, you know, like whether that's packing up orders every night and making sure it gets dropped off on time, going and getting product, you know, all of that little stuff that you just don't think about when you're, you know, sort of maybe necessarily planning it out, you know, that, that falls on you until you're in a position to where you can get, you know, people on board to help you with that and you can really sort of, you know, try and focus on that. So it, it's, um, it's it's a fun lifestyle if you're someone who loves the challenge and loves that drive and you're a driven person and you get your accomplishments like Matt said from building things if that's what gets you going it's it's the lifestyle for you but it is not glamorous by any means you're going to work a lot and you're going to do a lot of things that you're like I can't believe I'm doing this I own the business but it has to get done you know it stops with you so yeah, and I just, so my my husband works in marketing and graphic design, and unfortunately, during COVID, he was laid off, and for about nine months during COVID, he was doing freelance graphic design work, so I'm intimately uh, aware of, like, just even things like incidentals, like stuff that you, you're not used to having to pay for that, like, um, my husband's name is Matt, that Matt and I just had to figure out, like, Oh, all right, that costs money. And and that's something that you have to have to consider when you're thinking about that. But also producing those clients and doing the legwork to to find the people that you want to do business with and to uh, continue to grow uh, revenue when you're thinking about, well, in Matt's case, it's a service that he's providing and being able to um, being able to locate those things. All right, well then let's talk about something that gets you excited, um, something that maybe you're currently working on. Of course, I know some of those projects might be under wraps, um, but is there stuff that, um, that you do that you're currently working on that gets you excited that you're really jazzed about? Um, so I, I would say for, uh, for myself right now, we're working on a couple of product development ideas that we've you know, had in the works for a while. Um, you know, COVID sort of pushed those back a little bit. It also allowed us, gave us a little bit of time to really focus on them, but uh, their projects around um, sustainability and how we can use the waste from the production of our ready to drink beverage and upcycle that into future products um, and utilize it. So it is something I'm very excited about just from the, the standpoint of it's a topic, it's, a, it's an area that personally um, I'm very interested in. Um, and taking our company down that direction um, and being a leader in that space. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's something that we're, we're really working on. It's exciting from the standpoint of, you know, learning every day about all this, you know, all the types of products out there that we can do with it. So um, yeah, that, that's probably the number one thing right now for me. We are launching a new brand. Um, 
that should uh it, it was supposed to open in june of uh of 2020 that didn't happen for some reason um <laughs> but uh we're, we're we're putting in uh, an upscale indoor mini golf bar and restaurant in the heart of power and light um and so uh we're really really excited to do a contemporary um artistic take on mini golf that I think uh, our target our target market is is folks in their 20s to 40s um, and so it's not necessarily the mini golf that we all grew up with and and there's certainly some there, there's some tabletop versions of that as well that kind of lend themselves more to a food and beverage climate and so um, you know having we had to kind of sit on this project for you know it's been a year and a half now that it's just kind of been waiting and we're finally able to like release and get going and get moving on it and uh we we expect to open that hopefully quarter three um maybe quarter four and we're really really excited to do that so we will invite everyone out love it um so what i'm really excited about is within uh within business you come to find out quickly that lots of what a business is is a step-by-step -step process it's like a system right? And a lot of times you do that system over and over and over again. And on the operations side, uh, from what I know now is the, maybe the quicker you can cl complete that process with the highest level of quality, um, right? That's whenever your margin increases, right? Uh, when you first start out, you typically like, okay, yeah, I'll do this service. I'll sell this. And yeah, I think it should cost this because, Someone else is doing it over here. And then you figure out, okay, I only have 23 cents per transaction or whatever it is, right? I'm really excited how we've, uh, and we're continuing to optimize, that's kind of a, a buzzword, but the project life cycle. So for one of my companies, Classroom Marketing, um, anything we do goes down the project life cycle. Like something is created, like if it's a blog, it starts somewhere and it gets pushed down until it's approved and then published, right? has a life cycle and lots of things do that. So I'm very excited. I'm kind of like a operationally minded guy myself. So anything we can do to quicken that process up, but also retain the quality, like in manufacturing a project, right? The quicker you can push it out with the same level of quality, uh, the, the better your business is going to be. So that's what I'm really excited about on uh, for 2020, at the end of 2020, up into this coming year. So cool. It's exciting to hear about all the stuff that you all are working on. Is there anything that you wanted to add about any challenges or growth areas that you have all right now? I think all three of you have kind of alluded to stuff that has been going through your own, own brands, but anything you want to add? We're, we're at the stage where for us to grow to the capacity that we, we would like to grow, that we need to grow, um, we can no longer do it with my money, to, to be very frank. Um, and so the, the part of that, too, is our industry is old enough. You know, escape rooms have been around in the U.S. for about eight years now. Axe throwing has been in North America for roughly 10, though the explosive growth has just been the last three. Um, our biggest initiative over the last 12 to 18 months has been to become an investable company. Um, and so we've had some, it, it's been really interesting to think of my job and how it's changed over the course of the last, you know, six years. Because in the early days, like I was the guy building stuff. I was the guy with a wrench or a hammer helping develop puzzles. And, and I still get to do the development of it. Um, but now, like my single biggest goal is to meet with three investment partners per month. Um, which is also just a weird thing. So I'm like, so you guys don't need me to do this and that? They're like, no, no, no. Like, I mean, we had we got to a point, we had our quarterly planning meeting recently, and we literally have our plan for the rest of this year. Um, like, no matter what I want to dream up or create, because that's kind of my role is to be a visionary, like, we don't have room mentally or physically to do anything more than what we've committed to this year, um, which is wonderful um because it allows me to go on bike rides <laughs> you know but it's terrifying because it's like all right like so what do i what do i need to do now to add value um and and the folk like 
this thought that I could literally have three lunches this month and it would be considered a successful month for me is bizarre and exciting and terrifying. And, and I think it shows it's a big step for our company as well. Um, and so I shall not even remember your question. So I hope I at least spoke to it a little bit, but um, <laughs> we'll leave it there. I think, I think you touched it. We're good. <laughs> so biggest challenge for me, and I, I think the buzzword out there too is scale. You got to scale, 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 scale. Like, okay, you can say it all you want, but man, it is freaking hard to scale. Freaking hard. Um, I don't want to, I want to make sure that's clear. Um, of course it can be done, um, but within my own business, hiring, whether it's hiring people, even if you have a good problem of onboarding clients, right? Um, it's quite hard to not lose anybody, whether you're B2C or B2B. Um, and you really have to have some good knowledge or hire someone else who can help you do that. Um, it's so easy to say, that's been a big challenge, um, a good positive challenge, but a very difficult challenge is, is scaling up. What does that even look like? Like people just say it all the time. Um, it's basically uh, gaining more accounts or customers and then your system, current system breaks or you find bottlenecks, which means everything's getting stopped. It's like a drain. It's like stopping right there and filling up and you have to unclog the drain. Um, it's just, it's been quite a challenge. Uh, but it's been a challenge, as these guys know, uh, to, to conquer it. And it's not all about the money, even. It's like those little challenges that kind of fuel, fuel the fire. Um, and uh, you got to kind of like eating dirt for a little bit. You do. And that, that's kind of one of those ways where it's like you wear multiple hats. You're the janitor now. Uh, but that's been one of the biggest challenges uh, since we started. Yeah, I would just, I would agree with that, you know, sort of the, the biggest challenge is always just scale, you know, how can you grow, how can you take this to the next level, I think, you know, in, in our particular industry to that, it brings, that would also bring along with it kind of this windfall of other things in terms of, you know, efficiencies on the, on the production side of it, on the supply side, on the supply side of, of things, um, you know, it's, yeah, that's, scale and then also getting into a, um, a, a predictable demand forecast um, that we can rely on. I mean, we thought we had that last year and then COVID, you just kind of threw that out the window, you know, that was just gone. Um, so it's, it's sort of kind of getting to that so you can plan your operational side of things, you know, especially for us, we have a, a core ingredient that's harvested once a year, you know, so we got to make sure that that harvest, we're, we're good for a year, you know, and it's a delicate balance uh, between doing too much and not, and then not having enough and just, yeah, continuing to grow and get better in those little areas. One point on the scale real quick is um, there's a determining, or there's a decision that every entrepreneur has to make. Do you want to scale? Sometimes people don't want to scale. Um, you mentioned Ashley, your, your husband, I believe, Matt, right? I mean, let's say he's like, yeah, I really like this freelance thing. And maybe I don't want to go back to the job he has to decide, does he want to scale? He doesn't have to scale. And so for me, I'd say, do I even want to scale? Could I just have a small team and kind of be good and consistent? Like, I think that's maybe another myth too, is that you have to grow into this massive company, which you honestly don't. And that's when a lot of challenges, actually, I would have to assume that that's when you risk losing your whole company is whenever you want to scale up because then you make massive uh, bad decisions. So I think that's anyone listening right now thinking like, okay, become an entrepreneur, start here, grow, 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 become, you know, Bill Gates or whatever. Nah, it's, <laughs> it's not it. So um, I think that's the determining factor. And the challenge too is you have to decide, do you want to scale or not? Good and point. My, my, on that note, right, David, just real quick, my first company that I ended up selling, you know, it was, it was literally because we, I have a partner, you know, in that company, good friend of mine, we start this thing, it's as successful as we hoped it was. We didn't talk about what our goal was before we started. And so once it was successful, I was like, let's do it again. And then let's do it again. And then let's do it again. And we came to find that my partner, that was not his goal. You know, like he was like, no, I'm, I like this one, you know? Um, and, and all of a sudden it was like, oh gosh, like we have this fork in the road. Um, and, and fortunately, we were able to work something out, you know, where it made sense for him to stay and made sense for me to go and, and stay with Breakout. Um, 
but that was, uh, yeah, like you don't have to scale. <laughs> um, there was a point in time, I think it was our fourth year and we had someone consulting us and he was like, Matt, do you realize if you would have just stayed with only your first location, you would have actually made more money at this point than you would have with these six locations. And that was because we were investing so much money into this headquarters growth engine that now has allowed us to grow really well and, and exceed obviously well beyond that first door. But yeah, scaling, I think you hit the nose in the head. It's, it's freaking hard. Um, but it's also, that's like, if, if the goal is to make as much money as possible or to grow as big as possible, that's the only way to do it. All right. Uh, well, and the, the, the beauty, I think, uh, or the silver lining in being unemployed is that it offered my husband, Matt, a lot of time to think about what that's scaling and what direction he wanted to pursue. And he ultimately decided to, to go back into like corporate setting. But he now focuses all of his freelance efforts on, so he's really big into Magic the Gathering, actually. So he does mostly, um, he, mostly freelance work for like nerd dumb sort of things like he makes t-shirts or dice or cards or play mats and things like that. So yes, scaling is a big thing to think about is where do you want your focus to be and, um, and kind of where you want your effort to, to lie in your money to Matt's point <laughs> about uh, where you want your resources to go. All right, so we are coming up on our hour. So I wanna make sure that we're prioritizing questions here. So um, let's talk about just advice that you might have. So for students on this call, or students that might be interested in entrepreneurship and wanting to do this for their, themselves, what advice do you have for them? What can they be doing now while they are in school, whether they are pursuing their bachelor's degree or their graduate degree, what can they be doing to help themselves for future them? If, if I've had, the reason that I've been successful has been entirely because of my friends, my net, I call it network, I suppose. I'll premise by saying I really don't like networking. Um, but I think two things that I've done pretty well is uh, I'm relatively likable and I've tried to stay that amongst not just like my friend group, but people in general. Like I try to be kind to people. Um, but I think in addition to that, I have never balked at asking folks for help. Um, so when we first started going, you know, we were this, this new industry, new concept that most folks had, had not heard of. And so I had to convince people to show up like, hey, we're going to lock you in a room and you have to find your way out. And people are like, and I have to pay you for it. I'm like, yes. Um, and, and with axe throwing as well, like it's, it's equally crazy. Um, so, you know, we, this was back when Facebook was like, cool, you know, however many years ago. And I, and I asked, thousands of people. I was like, hey, we started this new thing. I would really appreciate your support um, and put myself out there. And, and fortunately, be it because of past relationships or whatever, like people said, yes. They said, Matt, you know, we had a great friendship or I've known you for how long. I'd love to come support you. And that was what built the snowball that then kind of rolled to the folks who I didn't know. Um, but you know, to a degree, there's no, from, from an educational brass tacks book smart standpoint, there's no difference between your degree at UMKC than there is at XYZ online university, right? The difference is the network and the people that you meet along the way. Um, I would say that 90% of my education happened outside of the four walls of the classroom. And, and if you guys are not investing your time in getting to know folks, outside of your classes, you are doing it wrong. Um, and so I would encourage you to, I mean, I, it's the same dumb advice that you hear, but like get involved with stuff, um, meet new people, um, understand that your network here is more than likely gonna be the foundation for your network in the job space. Um, and the, the more and the better that you can do that, the better prepared and more options you're going to have once you get out of your, your undergraduate or graduate degrees. Um, I would say my advice, um, and I think Matt really hit the nail on the head with the whole, with the networking is also just getting out there and find people, you know, um, that, that are experts, that are mentors, someone that you, you know, has, has been through the industry that you've worked with. I know that's been extremely valuable in my career at Tohi is, 
um, you know, we had an advisor on board and she, she kind of took me under her wing and, and really showed me the rope, showed me how she did things when she was at McCoy and Pepsi. And it, it's really helped me to build that strong foundation. So to get out there and try and find those people and then also to circle back to what David said at the very beginning of this conversation about you know trying to find people entrepreneurs and small business owners and interview them and get to know them like also seek out opportunities to go and work for these these companies um you know i'll tell you right now you know we have uh, a wide range array of areas that we could use help with we don't necessarily have a job posting on it but you know just reach out you know send them your resume um send them a note say hey i would love to come on learn the business i can help with this you know, if some, however you can do that to get in there, because when you're, you're in it and you're living and you're breathing it, you'll see what it's like to be in a small business and an entrepreneur. And that's how you'll find out if this is for you. And if it's not, that's completely fine. But I'm telling you, the sooner you can kind of figure that out, the better. So seek out those opportunities. Don't wait for a job posting. Reach out, um, you know, and then. You know, my last advice on that was always to pay it forward. You know, I was blessed to have someone take me under their wing. Um, I try and do that as much as I can. So when you are in a position to be a mentor to someone, always say yes. You know, be willing to get a coffee with someone and talk with them um, about your experiences and what's happened. Um, you know, always be willing to pay it forward because that's, you know, that's really sort of what it's all about. It's a tight network, I think, for entrepreneurs and small businesses in Kansas City. So get in with them um, and, and kind of take that opportunity to, to meet as many as you can. All right. So I have three specific things with the bonus thing at the end. Uh, so write these down, anybody who's listening. So I think it was John who asked this question, right? Gaining experience. Um, you need these three things or you need to do these things, um, whether you create it in yourself or you already have this naturally within yourself. Number one is you have to love the process. You truly have to, everything what we talked about today, I think combines to say that you have to love the process no matter where you're at. You have to love building something. You have to love eating dirt. You have to love being the janitor as much as you do this fancy person who wears a tie and talks with investors. I don't know if Matt wears a tie, but looks like he's a t-shirt guy. Okay. Uh, but you have to love all parts of the process, even uh, not equally, but you have to be willing to go through it. Okay. So you have to number one, love the process of building Number two is you have to have a reasonably sized failure tolerance, meaning if you keep on failing and those failures keep stacking upon each other, you have to have the tolerance to get over that. Some people just, when they fail, they're kind of done. And you have to have such a high tolerance for you to really see any type of success in the future. I know each one of us has probably failed many times. I've failed multiple times where I think, well, I guess I, I'll go look for a job now, <laughs> you know, something like that. But it's kind of intriguing because after you get over that threshold of even failing multiple times, that's whenever you truly start to succeed. So number two, you have to have a very high failure tolerance. And then number three, the most practical advice I think I can get everyone right now is do things for free, like totally free. If you're in college right now, um, wh whatever you want to do, uh, shadow someone for free, uh, start creating something and giving away for free, uh, and then understand what you like and don't like about it and if that would work or not. In the beginning, whenever I started freelancing, before I even got paid, man, I'd go to businesses and be like, can I write some blogs for you? Uh, sure, sounds good. And I kind of outlined a strategy and I went above and beyond from my experience, what I could do for them and just doing things for free. And I think that can go uh, any for any type of industry. So those are the three practical things. Uh, the last one I'm going to show you. Hold on just one, one second. All right. This book right here, I did not write this book. Um, it's called Business Made Simple by Donald Miller. It's 60 Days to Mastering Everything You Need to Know About Owning a Business. Uh, I'm not paid for this, I swear. I love this book. Literally everyone in this class, if they're thinking about being an entrepreneur, should read this book right here. It goes through everything you need to know. And honestly, I think it's better than sometimes an education that you'll pay for in Business 101. So 100%, it's called Business Made Simple. It's the blue book. 
Um, it'll go through negotiation, mastering sales, marketing, management, personal pro- productivity. It's legit. Totally go purchase that when you can. I'm on the dollar note. Donald. Hey, there we go. Blue like jazz. Yeah, man. Second, second that. He's a good guy. Fantastic. I love that all of you kind of alluded to just meeting people and just expressing interest in learning and shadowing. I actually had a student um, who reached out to a consumer products startup in Kansas City and offered to start their TikTok. (laughs) And um, it's since- That's a challenge. Um, it's since ballooned and, and, um, they're, they're doing really cool things. And so, um, yeah, like if you see something that you want to learn about, don't be afraid to ask about it, uh, especially in the entrepreneurial space and, and, and reaching out to the people that might be in that organization who can answer some questions that you might have. All right. Uh, we heard about resources from David, a little bit from Matt. Austin, do you have any resources that you'd like to share for, uh, inspire or aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, I don't have any books with me, but I would just <laughs> say, um, I think the best resource is just, um, and I, I, I hate to just beat this, beat this drum the whole time, but I think it's just your network. It's the people that you surround yourself with. Um, you know, those are the people that are living, breathing it every day. Um, I mean, I, I would, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, find the books. There's a book that I really love for the CPG industry called Ramping Your Brand. Um, it is a phenomenal book as far as how to help to scale your business and take it to that next level. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the best resource is just getting out there and meeting these people that are living and breathing it and doing it. Um, and, you know, I... I always say this, like, just don't, don't wait for it. Don't wait for the job posting. Don't wait for David or Matt or myself to come to you because, you know, we're, we're running our own business. You know, we're not going to have the time to do it. So reach out to them. Um, you know, don't be afraid to do that. So. I do want to put it out there that the entire reason that I know Dave and Matt are because I reached out to them through LinkedIn. So use resources um, to your advantage. I also want to put a plug in for my office and literally what I do. It's my job to help every one of you get a job and develop these professional skill sets. So if you want to learn how to use LinkedIn networking, for example, or develop your profile, that's something that my office can help with. All right. Um, any last advice? I know we're coming up on our hour and I know all of your time is precious. So do you have anything else that you want to share with our students before we end our call? So I just looked down and I have three of these books right here. I give them to all my team. Literally, if you follow me on Instagram and message me and give me your shipping address, I'll ship three of these to whoever's on here for free, legitly. It'll cost me money, but I'll, I'll do it hundred percent. Like that's because I believe in the, like this stuff. Like He's impacted me so much. So if anybody wants this book, I got three of them. Thank you, David. That's super generous. Um, yeah, three. I would say, um, I think one of the things that I've done that I encourage folks to do is really evaluate what your risk is and what your risk tolerance is. Um, when we talk about failure, I think a lot of times folks assume the worst. Um, or when we talk about like what could go wrong is a question like, well, how, how bad can it get? And I think the reality is, is COVID was worse than I would have told you that it could possibly get, right? Like we were like, all right, what if we have a 60% drop in sales, a 50% drop in sales? We had a 100% drop in sales. But I think oftentimes when people think of failure, they think that failure equates to like living in a van down by the river and losing all your friends and having everyone hate you. And the reality is, is that's not what it is, right? So Oftentimes I've thought like, hey, what is, if this thing goes as south as I think it can go south, what's the worst that could happen? For me, the answer was like, I would have to move in with my parents. Like I'd take my wife and my three kids and we'd move into mom and dad's basement. And as I thought about that, I was like, honestly, like that's not that bad. Like if that's genuinely the worst it can get for me. And I I realize I'm very fortunate that I have parents who have a basement, right? Like you might not have that situation, but when I realized that like that is my worst case scenario, it has given me the, um, I guess the audacity and the ability to realize like, okay, like there's, it may seem like a lot of risk here, but it's not like, I can't fall that far. Um, 
So I, I would encourage you to really evaluate what, again, what your risk tolerance is, but really evaluate what the risk actually is. Um, and I think once you understand the worst case scenario, it also makes it a lot easier to potentially decide either to invest or it gives you a lot of clarity of why you should pull out of that idea of that thing. Yeah, I would say sort of part of advice would be, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's your journey, you know, it's your life. So don't, don't get caught up in, you know, I think today everyone's so connected with everything and social media and seeing what so-and-so is doing. So like, it's, it's, it's your own journey. You're on your own time frame. So definitely take that route with it. Um, and I would also say, you know, just, I guess just sort of have thick skin, you know, find people that will give you honest feedback, um, not someone that's going to tell you it's good because they're afraid of hurting your feelings. Like you need to hear when an idea is an awful idea before you go live with it or when it is a good idea. So find those people and open yourself up to that and don't take it personal. Um, you know, those are the people that want to really see you succeed. That's why they're giving you that honest feedback. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just leave it at this too uh, for the day is like, if any of you guys want to reach out to me through LinkedIn, um, actually, you can share my email, uh, please do. But I know, you know, here at Tohi, I know that we're always looking to grow and looking for the right people. So like I said, definitely reach out if it's something that you're interested in. If you just want to have a, a coffee and learn more about it or see if there's a way that you could come on and help, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to talk to anyone. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and close out the hour then. Again, thank you so, so much for giving up your time and just being able and willing to share kind of your wisdom.